Amen. Well, I'm super excited. We were supposed to, I was going to start my uh, John series this week, <clears throat> and we're starting that next week. But I just really, talking to George, they, him and his wife bought uh, Rivka, were, are, were already planning on coming to hang out with us. And I was like, man, with all the stuff happening on in the, going on in the world, I just really felt we needed to hear prophetically what God is doing in the earth so let's let's invite George up here to come up here and share the word of God. Uh, if that's a clap for me, let's hear a bigger clap for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're coming soon. I mean, believe that. If you understood as I understand things, I mean, I can taste heaven. I mean, we are so close now. Before I get started, so Abba Father, I ask you, Lord, that your Ruach, your spirit, would just be poured out fresh and new upon every person here, Father. I ask you, Father, you give them ears to hear, prophetic eyes to see. And Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would bind up every spirit of fear and pour out a spirit of courage, a spirit of, of, of understanding, Father. And Father, I ask you, Lord, for a fresh anointing that delivers this word, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah, amen. If I say Yeshua, it's just Jesus' Hebrew name. I use them interchangeably all the time. For those that don't know, my wife and I, I actually have been a pastor in Israel for the last 20 years. But for the last, oh, four years, I've been redeployed to America. In a crazy set of circumstances, I am not planning more than one or two weeks in advance. I am led, led by the Spirit. We're still speaking four or five times a week. I've traveled 180,000 miles since this whole thing got started. For those that don't know, I run a site called Worthy News. Worthy News was found in this verse, watch ye therefore. Watch, one of the Hebrew words for a, a Christian is the word notzrim. Can you say with me, notzrim? It's the same Hebrew word for watchman. We're all called to be watchmen. And the idea for a watchman is to, to blow the shofar, to warn that judgment is coming. And it says in Ezekiel, if the, if the shofar blower, the, the watchman, doesn't sound the shofar, doesn't warn the judgment, the blood is required at the watchman's hands. And there's a serious calling in that. And we have to understand that, that God is giving us understanding of how to pray into the events in this world. The reality is that the media is, doesn't, doesn't have that perception and doesn't have that understanding. And there's so many things happening in the world that we need to pray into. So the idea was to give you your prayer points for the day and then the worthy to just, how many realize the Lord is coming back really soon? So that's why we go ahead and we put out a daily devotion as well. But the very first thing that, that Yeshua, that Jesus said about the last is take heed that no man deceive you. So the next time you turn on the news and you know that it's not true, just praise Jesus because they're telling you that his word is true. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. It's so crazy. But if you would like to sign up for a word of the breeze, we have journalists now in Jerusalem, Budapest, Rome, throughout the United States, and everything that we publish is worthy to be read. I'm not going to give you any junk news. There's just so much going on in the world. So we, let's get started. What you have to understand is the world is in the middle of a test, and we're all being tested. It says the Lord tests the righteous. If Jesus was tested for 40 days and 40 nights, why are you surprised that you're in the middle of a test? If, if the children of Israel had to be tested in the wilderness before they went into the promised land, why are you surprised? But in this passage, not only does it say he tests the righteous, and the great thing about the test we're taking, it's an open book test. I mean, if you are having trouble with your test, I mean, I wish I went to college and it was an open book test, you know? And it's an open book test. We already have the answers. But in this passage, it also says, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. The word violence there is the word Hamas. Literally the same Hebrew word of the terrorist organization in Gaza. It's the same word used in Genesis 6 when God told Noah, I will destroy the world because it is filled with Hamas. Okay? So this so you understand where we're coming from. Now, people ask me all the time, what do I think should happen inside of, inside of Gaza? Well, you have to understand that right now there's 2.2 million people inside of Gaza that Jesus loves, absolutely loves them, and wants to see them coming to the kingdom. And right now, there's only three churches in all of Gaza, one evangelical church, the Gaza Baptist Church, and this church actually has such a hatred for Israel, it works toward Hamas's propaganda. 
Now, the reason why I actually threw this slide up here is because I want you to understand that Google and the search engines considers Wikipedia a source of truth. But in this article, you'll see that in the state of Palestine, there is no state of Palestine. Just to show you, you can't really believe everything you read on the internet. Now, you have to understand that right now, there is such a war going on. Since 2007, when Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, they literally hunted missionaries. This is an article that we had in 2007. For those that don't know, I've been doing Worthy News since 1999, so we've been doing them for 25 years. But now they were hunting missionaries, and not only that, the only Bible society in Gaza, the bookstore there, its owner or its manager was assassinated. Just months after Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, can you imagine a place where you cannot buy a Bible? That is the Gaza Strip. They don't even have an opportunity to say no to the gospel. They don't have, they don't have an ability to say no because they don't even have an opportunity to buy a Bible. Do you think that the United Nations is going to remove Hamas? Or Israel? Or who's the only one? Only Israel is going to remove Hamas. And so what we're praying is that Israel is able to remove Hamas so that I believe Christian NGOs are going to go in and an NGO is a non-government organization like Samaritan's Purse, like World Vision, going in, opening up the door and presenting the gospel through our lives and being able to just hand out Bibles. I believe that the word is going to be fulfilled that God is redeeming people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And that there's tribes inside of Gaza that he's trying to reach. The next thing you have to understand is that everything that's coming out of Gaza is filtered through a Hamas lens. Now, what I mean by that is um, just a few weeks after the war started, there was a hospital that was hit. It was actually hit in the parking lot. But Hamas claimed that Israel hit a hospital and that 500 lives were killed. It turned out to be false. It turned out it, it happened to be a rocket that misfired. Most people don't realize that rockets that are fired by the terrorist organizations, 20% actually never make it out of Gaza, and they actually land within Gaza. This happened to be a misfired rocket. It landed on a hospital parking lot. About 20 people were killed. It wasn't 500, it was 20 people, but it was their own rocket. But because of this, you actually had huge protests outside the embassies of Israel and the United States, outside of Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. Can you imagine if the embassy was overrun? We would have almost been in World War III. And that was because the New York Times and the media trusted Hamas as, a terrorist, as an organization of truth. Listen, no one watches the press conferences. I watch the press conferences. It's on Al Jazeera. This is what a Hamas press conference looks like. Would you believe anything that they would say? I mean, I'm just being real. Yet the media goes ahead and grabs hold of it, and, and what they're doing is they're sowing seeds of hate because they're really just being a propaganda, a, a vocal arm or a, vocal, a voice for the terrorist organization. And this has actually brought forth a level of anti-Semitism that we've never seen. And we're seeing the rise of anti-Semitism. You have to understand that this is actually prophetic. That God is now at work. And it says at the beginning when he travels to the Jewish people back home to their homeland that he uses fishing. He uses a net and a hook. And, you know, you, if you think about fishing, you're, you're either casting a net or you're throwing a lure and you're drawing. Unless you're in Alabama. In Alabama, they use dynamite. But... But here we are, they're drawing now. And then it says, afterward, I will send forth hunters. So how do you think they hunt for them? How do you think there's a rise of hatred that's going to drive Israel? So this is actually prophetic in nature, but we shouldn't be part of this. And we have to understand that we're in the middle of a test. You know, the ancient kingdom of Persia is where Haman had come forth and it had attempted to destroy the Jewish people. This same principality that was driving this ancient kingdom of Persia is modern day Iran. It's the same area that in Daniel 10, Daniel's praying, he says, but the prince of Persia withstood me 21 days. There was a principality that was trying to prevent prayer from being answered. That same principality is at work today trying to eradicate the Jewish people. And at this time, Mordecai says to Esther something very interesting. He says, says to Esther, if you remain completely silent this time, don't worry, because relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from another place. Meaning that God's prophetic plan for the Jewish people will happen with or without you. 
He doesn't need us. This is a test question for us. And who knows, guess what? You've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. We've been brought to give us an understanding of what we're supposed to do. Because Israel's finding out who his true friends are. Our true friend loves at all times in Proverbs. But now they're not finding out who their true friends, they're finding out who its family is. Because we as believers, they're realizing these people are sticking with us while the world hates us. And you have to realize that there's a lot of ministries right now. They're saying, hey, look, you need to bless them and you're going to be blessed. A lot of those ministries that are calling for the, 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 the support of Israel are not sowing in the seeds of salvation that need to be sown. I want you to understand that, that, that this gospel is given to who? To the Jew first and also to us. And this gospel message, right, Paul said with his heart, he says, with great anguish and sorrow, I wish I could go ahead and express the need for their salvation. And he says, if I could, I would allow myself to go to hell if I knew it would be the salvation of my entire people. That was Paul speaking. That should be our heart because, you know, Paul says, look, be imitator of me just as I'm an imitator of who? Of the Messiah. And Jesus came who? To the lost house of Israel first. And Paul goes in and explains a mystery. He says, now look, if their trespasses, talking about the Jewish people, if their trespasses means riches for the world and their failure, riches for the Gentiles, how much more were the full inclusion? What will happen when they come to faith? And Spurgeon understood this and he wrote, he says, I don't think that we attach enough importance to the restoration of the Jews. Those that were the first missionaries, the first apostles to us who are far off, for they should be regathered again and again. But notice what he says here, and I put this in yellow because it's so, until that shall be, the church's glory can never come. Matchless benefits are tied to the salvation of the Jews for the regathering, for the regathering as shall be his life from the dead. What the church has to understand is one of its test questions is we, we, we ask and we say, Lord, Lord, send revival. And one of the keys to revival is actually sowing in and praying in the seeds of salvation into Israel. Anyone that's talking about the need for, to support Israel, check out their mission statement and see if they're really, really focused on the salvation of Israel. Because I'm telling you right now, there's so many ministries that are in Israel, that are active in Israel, that make their volunteers sign papers saying that they will not share the gospel. That's the very heart of who we are. We should not have to change who we are to be a light because we're afraid of being offensive. Listen, this gospel is so, it's not just a, a life and death, it's an eternal life and eternal death question. And it has to be the core of who we are. And so now as we get into this understanding, we're alive for this particular moment in history. And we're alive for what I call the harvest of the world. Now, I want you to go back with me. And if you go back and you read the word and you'll understand that Peter, being this, this Jew, has this stream and this stream was clean and unclean animals. And he, being a Jew, didn't eat any pigs or didn't eat. There was things that were unkosher. And, and God gives him this, this vision of clean and unclean animals. He says, go eat. And he's freaked out by it. And he goes, I don't know what this means. And Cornelius, the servant, comes and he goes to Cornelius and all of a sudden, it wasn't a shock that a Gentile came to faith. Because we saw Gentiles come to faith at different points before. What was shocking to Peter was that they were filled with the Holy Spirit like the Jews were. That was the thing that shocked him. And, and, and then when he comes back to Jerusalem, they heard that they, he went. And they actually confronted him. The Jews confronted him. And he explains the whole vision. And he says, praise God. God has opened up this thing to the Gentiles. We didn't understand how great God's plan was. And at that time, they're trying to figure out, these Jewish leaders are trying to figure out, what do these Gentiles have to follow in order to believe? They were actually trying to figure out, what do they got to, and what's the irony is, at the end of the age, is that the script is flipped. Because you got a lot of Gentiles trying to figure out what do these Jews have to do in order to believe? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that simple. It's not that complicated. But in this time, as they're having this discussion and trying to work this thing out, at the Jerusalem Council meeting, 
James stands up and actually quotes this passage in Amos. And in the Acts passage, after this, I will return. I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name declares the Lord who makes these things known from of old. So God goes ahead and gives James this prophetic insight. What's interesting is that that's not where the passage in Amos ends. Because it continues in verse 14 and 15. It says, and I will bring back the cast of my people Israel. In the first century, when James quotes Amos 11 and 12, the Jewish people were still in the land of Israel. The temple was still there. Every, you know, the, 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 there wasn't anything to rebuild because they were already there. The temple gets destroyed in 70 AD, and that begins the dispersion of Jewish people all over the globe. When did they come back and rebuild? in the last 150 years. So this prophecy is actually talking about the end of the age. When it says they shall rebuild the waste cities, the city I live in is a city called Arad. If you forget it, we're between a rod and a hard place. A rock and a hard place, a rod and a hard Okay, don't worry. You'll get some coffee later. But this city was an ancient city. It was rebuilt in 1963. 1963 it was rebuilt. For 2,000 years, it wasn't a city. And guess what? Outside the city is what? Vineyards and greenhouses, just like the prophecy talks about. I will plant them in their land, and never again shall be uprooted on land. So for those that don't understand, God's got a prophetic plan for the Jewish people. And, and now we got to ask ourselves, what is this all about? Because 11 and 12 is the connection of Gentiles to something, and 14 and 15 is the Jews connected to something And so the central verse is verse 13. And verse 13, in a nutshell, is prophetic poetry. When the plowman should overtake the reaper, the treasure of grapes of him that sows the the seed, the mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow. And you ask yourself, what is that talking about? It's talking about a harvest so abundant, so great, even the the mountains are dripping with the overflow. The harvest of harvests. So the whole plan of God is about the harvest of the world. And if there's anything that you get out of today's message, get this chart in your brain. In a very short nutshell, there's always been a remnant. And a remnant in the time of of Jesus, this population of the world was right around 200, 250 million. I'm gonna just use a tithing as a remnant. We all tithe, right? So a tithing of 250 million would be 25 million, right? And then, and then in the year 1,000, we get right around 350, 400 million. So we'll tie that would be about 40 million. We get to 1880, it's about a billion people. This chart is actually not accurate. It's not up to date. This is the year 2000 at 6.25, 6.4 billion people. We're actually off the chart. We're at 8 billion. We're at 8 billion. Now, this is where it's the mind bender. Our harvest, because of the number of people, let's say it's just 10%, our harvest will actually eclipse the harvest of every generation before us combined. You're alive for the harvest of the world. And people are freaked out. Who's the Antichrist? When's the seven years of tribulation going to start? Prophecy was not given to us to freak us out. Prophecy was not given to us to make us schizophrenic and all freaked out. Prophecy was given to us to give us understanding the time that we're in so that we could be activated, so we could be energized, so we could understand what our calling is because the calling hasn't changed to go forth and make disciples. Prophetically speaking, if there's one word that's absolutely true about Matthew 24, is this, until this gospel is preached to the nations, then the end will come. We're focused on the wrong things sometimes. The message of the, of, of, of the end times is about how do we present this gospel? And what's going to happen is I think our remnant is going to be greater percentage-wise than any generation before us combined. Why? Because it actually takes more faith not to believe the last few prophecies that are going to be fulfilled. If you just empirically just look at the evidence, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the timing of the birth of Israel, the amount of prophecy that are coming forth now, the, the, just the amount of evidence, it's screaming at you. Jesus is coming. 
Now you actually have to have faith that the last few prophecies won't be fulfilled. And so now we're going into something because people don't understand that the gospel is exploding right now. In the last hundred years, we're seeing the explosion of the gospel in places where they thought God would be exterminated. I'll give you an example. In 1949, the Chinese Communist Party took over China. By 1953, there was not a single missionary left in China, and they said, we will eradicate God from China. The gospel exploded in China. And now there's over 100 million plus believers in China. The gospel is exploding right now in Iran. People don't understand that they, they thought they were going to eradicate the gospel. And now the fastest growing church is in Iran. And so now we have to ask ourselves, what is God doing now? So we're, we're birthing something. We're birthing a kingdom. I never met a woman who said, I love giving birth. And men, if you're smart, you never ask a woman if she's pregnant. Because if she's not, you may be dead. But there comes a point when a woman is nine months pregnant, you don't ask, are you pregnant? The question in, invariably, when is the baby due? And when the Lord said in Matthew 24, when you see all of these signs, know that then, that's why we're screaming now nine months where are you, Lord? It's Maranatha time. It's like, where are you? And now we're at this nine month. And when a woman's nine months pregnant, look, not only do women not sleep, but their husbands don't sleep either. I mean, no one sleeps because we're uncomfortable. That's what these last times is about. It's getting us out of our comfort zones to get us an understanding of what God is doing. God gives us a natural understanding so that we can understand the spiritual things that are happening. And, you know, one woman can't explain to another woman exactly what it's like to give birth. You can try to verbalize it in as many words, but you can never really understand it until you actually do it. And men, despite what Google says, you will never understand this. But the reality is that when a woman gives birth, now that she's experienced it, she has a comprehension of it. Now, right now, we're experiencing these last days. But it's really not happening just like the Bible. Well, it's happening just like the Bible says, but we're getting a better understanding of things happening. For example, it says in the Bible there'll be days like the, it will be pestilences, be diseases. Now, four years ago, if you went into a bank with a mask on, you were being arrested. A year after that, if you went into a bank without a mask, you were being arrested. And a year after that, only the bank tellers were wearing masks. So the question is, who's robbing who? But now we have a comprehension of COVID. We have a comprehension of this, that we didn't have an understanding before. It says in Luke, you know, it'll be like the days of Lot. And we understand that that's where Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's where the word sodomy comes from. So in the 15, 20 years ago, your, your thoughts were, uh, it'd be like the days of Lot. It was the LB movement. Well, now we got a whole different understanding because now we got the LBTG, you know, plus, you know, we, got, we, we ran out of letters, we just added the plus sign to include everything. But now it's becoming more, it's becoming alive to us. Now we're getting a better understanding. Daniel said the prophecy would be sealed until the time of the end. But the whole reason why we're in, why I'm talking about this is because there's something that happens in the natural that tells you the baby's really close. There's a water breaking moment. I mean, if you're driving to the hospital and that water breaks, you better think about delivering that baby in the car. When that water breaks and the water's connected to the Spirit of God, there's a, a breaking moment. Did the contraction stop? No. The contractions got a whole lot harder, but you knew that you were almost finished the race. So what I want to take you back, I want, I want you just to go back with me. And can you just put yourself in the mindset of the apostles? Because the apostles were told over and over again different things by Jesus himself, and they still didn't understand, even though Jesus told it to them verbatim. For example, Jesus said, I'm going to die on a cross, and after three days I'm going to rise again from the dead. They were told that over and over again. When he was at the Last Supper, he says, He that dips bread with me is the one that will betray me. 
And the irony is that all the apostles says, is it me, is it me, is it me? When Judas dips his dip, he goes, oh, it must be because Judas has the money bag and he's got to go do something. Didn't understand that Judas just left. Didn't understand he was betraying them. Had no concept of it. When he's betrayed, you know, they're freaked out. When he's at the cross, church history tells us only John was the one that was there. All the other apostles were hiding. When they, they take him off the cross, we got to prepare him for his burial. He just said, I'm going to rise again from there. Why would you get burial cloth ready? But they go ahead and put him in a burial cloth. They put him, they put him in a tomb. When the Marys go to the tomb, they, where is he? Did the thought ever, did he rise again from the dead? They ran back to Peter and John to say, hey, what? So they ran to the tomb. Well, I wonder what's happening. I wonder what's happening. Now, when he actually appears to them, they go, it's a ghost. Look, you got to come and touch me. They had to actually touch him and like, oh, oh, what you said about rising from, this is what you meant. Oh, I think it's a lot like us understanding prophecy. Oh, and then when we get to heaven, we're going to get amazed and we're going to be like, oh, that's what you meant. It's going to happen so much. I think, oh, will be the biggest word in heaven. <laughs> but in this prophecy, here was Peter, you know, he, he, they're on the, on the Mount of Olives. He had been preaching them for 40 days about the kingdom of God. They were going in and out of their lives. And then he goes, I'm getting ready to take off. I thought we were setting up a kingdom. Where are you going? Well, listen, you just stay here to your do with power from one high. What's that mean? You have to find out. He takes off. What are we supposed to do now? We don't have a handbook. We don't, uh, you gotta be led of the spirit. Now all of a sudden they're in with power from on high. Peter sees tongues of fire. What is this? They're experiencing something that was told, but then they had to actually experience it. I think it's what it is for us in these last days. We gotta understand it, but now we're experiencing it. Now we gotta help, we gotta be felt led of the spirit. Like, where are we going? What are we doing? And now when he preaches this word, all of a sudden 3,000 Jewish souls come to faith. And when they come to faith, he gives them a word out of Joel. And it says, look, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. He talks about the outpouring of God's spirit. That was what they were experiencing. Now, if you just go just a few verses prior to that, the context of the passage starts in verse 23. Be glad, O children of Zion, for the Lord your God is giving you the early rain and the, the latter rain. That there was a, another outpouring coming. It was foreshadowing. Whoa. It was foreshadowing that. No, it was foreshadowing. It was foreshadowing another outpouring. We're talking about a birthing of a kingdom. And we're anticipating a water breaking moment. We're anticipating something that God's going to do. Now, this war, God allows this war to take place on a specific day. There is no coincidences, there's only God incidences. God allowed this word to take place in what was called Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah is a specific day in Jewish understanding. The Jewish people read through the Torah, that's the first five books, and the Hav Torah, the prophets, that's the rest of the Tanakh, or the rest of the Old Testament, and they read them in a systematic order. And they start in Genesis and they go to De Deuteronomy. Simchat Torah is when they start reading the yearly cycle of Genesis 1. Simchat Torah, the eighth day of Sukkot, is the great celebration day. It's an anticipation of the time outside of time. Number eight in Hebrew is connected to resurrection, connected to new life, connected to, to restoration. God is doing something. God allow this war to take place on a specific day. And not only does he allow it to take place on a specific day of Simchat Torah, 
It's the 50 year anniversary to the day of the Yom Kippur War. And 50 is Jubilee. All things restored back. That, that God is telling us something of the timing of the war. Now, most people don't realize that since this war is broken out, there are huge moves of God taking place around the world. Now, I'm gonna just mention one because this one's really on my heart. In Nicaragua, a communist nation close to the gospel, they just had an outreach to 650,000 people and tens of thousands of people came to faith. And the revival is so strong right now in Nicaragua that the Nicaraguan government is hunting pastors and the leaders down. I just posted the article yesterday or, or Friday. They're literally going forth to arrest them. The gospel is going forth in power. What you don't understand is that right now the gospel is going all across the Middle East. Muslims are having dreams and visions like they've never had before. We had an article that 200 men in Gaza had dreams of Yeshua, dreams of Jesus, and they came to faith. There are things happening supernaturally. I had another article. There was a dual earthquake in Turkey. And in a dual earthquake in Turkey, you know, there's kids buried on the rubble. And I actually have a story, two different stories, but stories of kids that were buried under the rubble for 15 days. 15 days they survived. And they said, how did you survive without water or food? They said, no, no, no. A man in white came and was giving me water and giving me food. And when I got scared, he sang to me and talked to me. God is moving and we're worried, we're freaking out. Who's the Antichrist? Figure out who Jesus is. And you gotta understand that there's something happening. There's something supernaturally happening around the world. Now, I'm gonna take you back to, to, to who was alive in 1967? Just wanna see. Okay, I'm just seeing who's older than I am, that's all. <laughs> 1966, Time Magazine, Is God Dead? The headline is The Age of Aquarius, Free Love, Free Sex. You know, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Church seemed dead. Is God dead? Was the prevailing headlines. 1967, a war breaks out in Jerusalem. When the war breaks out in Jerusalem, uh, uh, one of the guys that was with Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel um, is a very good friend of mine. He's 84, still preaching. Well, his son preaches, but he still takes a pulpit. Pastor John Higgins was one of the guys that was the, like, the managers of the House of Miracles. And these were like 200 halfway houses all over the, the West Coast that house hippies. The movie Jesus Revolution that just came out, the timing of that movie coming out tells you something. But what you had was this whole generation of fatherless. And they found out Jesus was their father. And all these hippies could relate. Why? Because they talked about love. Talked about peace. That's what they talked about. That was what their essence was. I just want a peaceful, loving life. And so now they got off the, the fake high and got on the spiritual high. Because God wants to have the spiritual high. And so what happened was you had all these people and the church didn't know what to do with these people. They really didn't understand and there was no fathers. I believe that God set up this whole generation of hippies, not for that age, but for our age. What I think is happening right now is that people don't understand before the Lord comes, he says that he's gonna turn the father's hearts of the, of, of the fathers back to the children. And the hearts of the children back to the fathers that God actually didn't need a few father figures. He needed a whole generation of father figures to raise up this harvest. That he actually set up the harvest in such a way that now that you, you know, you were young, you were having dreams and visions. I'm not saying you're old. You're just really much wiser than I am. But the dreams and visions are coming back. I believe that God has set up those that you thought were in retirement. No, you just beginning your walk. That the end is gonna be greater than the beginning. That what is actually set up is to set you free of time. He goes ahead and said, look, I'm, you thought you retired from work. No, 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 you just got a better work to do. 
that now you have time now to pray into these events. You have time now to go ahead and be the father and the grandfathers to the children. That there's a, this whole move of God that's happening. And God gave us an understanding of what happened in 1967. Now, when the revival happened in 1967, it wasn't a clean revival. There were so many cults and so many weird things happening the same time this Jesus revolution was taking place. It's gonna be the same thing at the end. You're gonna have the true revival in the midst of a bunch of weeds. And so you gotta go ahead and you gotta be, you know, be checked in your spirit. But this move, this, this war breaks out and there's so many things happening in, in the world, in, in Israel specifically, that tells us something. The Jerusalem Post came out with this article, Jerusalem's 2,000 pilgrims rose preparing for modern revival. I think an angel told him the headline. The road that it's connecting is connecting the, the, the pool of Siloam to the, to the Temple Mount. Now, when I first went to Israel in 2000, the tour guide shows me this pool. It's about three feet wide and about 20 feet long. He said, this is the pool of Siloam. I looked at him and said, that is not the pool of Siloam. He goes, no, archaeologist tells us this is the location of the pool. I said, it's not the pool of Siloam. I'm telling you right now. He goes, well, how do you know? Well, it just so happens that I've read Alfred Edersheim's Times and Life of the Messiah. It's 500 pages. It's written by a Jewish believer in the 1800s going through all the things that Jewish people had to do. And one of the things is that every Jewish man was required to go to Jerusalem for Passover, for, for Pentecost, and for tabernacles. So that in Jerusalem, at any given time, on those feasts, there'd be 100,000, 200,000 people. The whole city was packed. And before you went into the temple, you couldn't just go into the temple any morning. You had to go first to the Pool of Siloam and be washed. Before you walked into the temple, you couldn't go into the temple without getting washed. And I told the tour guide, you got about 50 people doing that washing. After that, everyone's dirty. They're not going out there. I mean, that's dirty people. We're digging this out. We're now down 12 feet. The, the road that's to the right of that, path, of that picture is actually the, 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 the road, the step road that we've uncovered in the last 15 years. It's the road that Jesus would have walked. Why? Because every Jew would have done their mikvah here at the Pool of Siloam. And for those who don't know, it's about an acre and a quarter in size. It's bigger than an Olympic-sized swimming pool. And the, the springs of Gishon flow into this. It's all fresh water. It's fresh springing water. In Hebrew, it's fresh living water. And every person has to go get a mikvah before they walked up to the temple. Now, I'm gonna, I want you to imagine yourself 2,000 years ago. Peter preaches the word. 3,000 Jewish people come to faith. If you did 3,000 people in that baptism site back there, after about the 50th person, it'd be dirty as I don't know what. I don't think they did it in a little, I think Peter just said, hey, let's walk down the pool of Siloam. Let's go ahead and let's, let's do mass baptism. So ready for the connection? If this is the place where the baptism of the church began, the baptism of the Jewish people began, and it says in Zechariah 12, 10, and they shall look upon me whom they pierced. It literally talks about the Jewish people having a vision of Jesus. That's how national redemption is going to come to place. When they come to faith, how many think they're going to get baptized? Could we be digging out right now the baptismal site for the nation? I just want you to think about that. We literally could be digging out right now, ready within a year or two, the baptismal site. Let's continue on. Now, this place is the place of the water drawing. The, the place of water drawing happened in Sukkot. Now, for those that don't know the Festival of Tabernacles, or the Festival of Sukkot in Hebrew, it's my favorite holiday. I mean, for eight days, you're commanded to rejoice. You're not allowed to be sad. You're not allowed to be angry. You're commanded to rejoice. If you are sad for any point in those eight days, you're actually in sin. You're commanded to rejoice. See, I love this. For eight days, my wife is not allowed to yell at me. I mean, I just love that. Eight days, I get to say, don't go fall into sin now. 
And believe me, I probably do it more than enough to get yelled at, trust me. But during this festival is the place of the water drawing. So the high priest would go down the pool saloon, he would take his pitcher and, and take it and dip it. And then he would take this whole processional march up. And when they dipped it, they would sing this song. It's actually found in Isaiah 12. And the word salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua. It's Jesus' Hebrew name. Behold, God is my Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua. And with, with joy you shall draw waters from the wells of Yeshua. So here's what they're singing. And you got to imagine, there's 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 people, and everyone's getting their mikvah before they go to the temple, and everyone's singing and dancing, and they're singing the song, and they're just singing this going up. It's like the Macy's Day Parade on steroids in Jerusalem in the first century. And so now when this happens, they get up to the top, and the high priest then quotes Psalm 118.25. Now the word save now in Hebrew is Hoshiana, uh, Hosanna in English. So it's Hosanna. I beseech thee, or I ask you, Lord. I beseech thee, send me a prosperity. The word prosperity, it, it, it's probably a better way to translate, grant me success. So look, Lord, would you please, you know, make my way prosperous? Would you grant me success right now? Now, I purposely posted the, the context of this because the very next verse literally says, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. This is the same passage that Jesus quotes in Matthew 23. Talking about the Jewish people and talking about, oh, Jerusalem, I wish I could gather you under my wings. I wish you would come to faith. I wish you would know who I am. And he says something here. He quotes Psalm 118.26. In Hebrew, it's Baruch Ababa Shem Adonai. They're saying, hey. Now, when the war started, before they go into Gaza, they're praying the prayer that said on the eighth day of Simchat Torah, on the eighth day of, of Tabernacles, on Simchat Torah, they're singing Psalm 118.25. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Ready for this? That means they're one verse away from the kingdom of God. Think about it. The next verse is, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, when the Jewish people read this passage, now, I want you to imagine yourself. 2,000 years ago, there's tens of thousands of Jews on the Temple Mount. And you can imagine tens of thousands of people that no one could hear anything except when the high priest reads Psalm 118.25, Every Jew was commanded to be quiet, pause, and reflect what God has done in their lives. The whole Temple Mount is quiet. Test, test, test. I don't know. Am I working? Okay, can I yell some more? Yeah. I'm yelling. Whoa. John, testing one, two. I know the Lord really wants you to understand this. The anniversary. The anniversary of the war is the anniversary when Jesus talked about the Spirit of God. And look what it says. It says, and, and now he said this about the Spirit, for yet the Spirit had not been given. And the question was, who is this Jesus? And I'm declaring to you today, he is the promised one that was provided from God to die for the sins of the world. He's coming again soon. And he's saying to you, I want to empower you because the harvest is coming and you need the power of God to usher in the harvest. And when he says this, it's kind of interesting because that night in Jerusalem, the, the, the candelabras, the, the, the menorahs would have lit up all of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem would have been a city lit up on a hill. And that next morning, there was a woman called an adultery. 
and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they try to get him, they try to condemn him, they try to go ahead and do something. And he said, look, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Now notice here, and the reason why I pull this up is because if we're going to be the fathers and the grandfathers to this fatherless generation, notice here, Jesus didn't say, you adulterer, go and sin no more. He doesn't say that. He says, look, you're in sin. Turn away from your sin. Stop sinning. I'm not condemning you. I'm forgiving you. And he that follows me shall have, be the light, shall have the light of the world. Shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. If we're going to be the fathers and the grandfathers, we've got to look past the tattoos. We've got to look past the nose rings and the earrings and the, you know, everything else under the sun. We're going to go ahead and reach a generation that needs a father. And we're going to introduce them to their heavenly father. And so now here's this passage. And when he talks about this, the only place the pool of Siloam is mentioned is in John 9. And here was the blind man. I think it's a picture of the entire world that's blinded. But specifically, I think it's a picture of the Jewish people blinded to the truth of their Messiah. But they're going to go to the pool of Siloam. And they're going to dip in, and their eyes are going to be opened to how God loved them from the beginning of the age. But in this passage, is something very interesting. It says, we must work the works of him who sent me wild as day, because night is coming when no man can work. I believe that God has given us the understanding that the hour that we have, or the time that we have to reach our friends and family is actually drawing to a close. He doesn't want you to focus on who the Antichrist is or the seven years of truth. He wants you to focus on the mission. The mission at hand to reach souls. Because the one that shines in Daniel 12 is those that turn those to righteousness. Those are the ones that are going to shine like the stars of heaven. We got to get refocused. I love this passage. And this is really connected to the number eight, behold, I'm making all things new. And prophetically speaking, it is done. God is outside of time. And he's looking now and he's, he's giving you a test question. What will you do with the time that you have left? It's time not to regret about the past. It's time to realize today is a new day. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But he says something here. He says, to the thirsty... There's a lot of people, spiritually speaking, that they got a cup of water and said, that, well, that's all, I, that's all I need. Now, they're worried about how their house isn't big enough, worrying about how their car isn't nice enough, but they're content with their glass of water. I'm telling you right now that we got to be people God saying, finish that, I need another cup. Just, I need another cup. Forget the cup, Lord, just turn on the faucet. Maybe we be people that just have the rivers flowing through us. Maybe we just be, just be outpouring and radiant of his love and radiant of his power. And, radiant. and right now we got to realize that the enemy of our souls is trying to damn us up. He's trying to literally create roadblocks in your life so you cannot go forth in power. He's trying to create, you know, sins of resentment, bitterness, anger, uh, you know, unforgiveness. I mean, there's a whole host of things. And God is saying, break forth the dam. Be thirsty. And don't just be content with a glass. Don't be content. Just say, man, would you just turn it on and don't stop until you return. And if you walk in that anointing, it's the one that is going to be conquering. And the one will be his God. He will be his God and will be his son. So church, arise and shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And guess what? Behold, darkness does cover the earth. And thick darkness, yes, the peoples. But if you walk in his anointing, the Lord will rise over you. And his glory will be seen upon you. For what reason? That the nations shall come to your light and the brightness of your rising. And in the same passage, if you really want to know, Hamas soon no longer be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders, but you should call your walls, you should call your defense, Yeshua. Jesus is our defense. 
And then when you know that Jesus is the light of your life and he is our defense and everything, guess what? The gates of your hearts will start screaming out, hallelujah, praise. So I'm a father, I ask you, Lord, that you would seal this word. I ask you, Father, that you would just pour upon this congregation just a fresh understanding of where we are prophetically. That we're called to be people with the rivers of living life just flowing through us. That we would go forth in power and might, that we would see nations come to your light. And Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would remove all spirit of fear, fear of the future, and replace it with courage to do what they're called to do, to be a gospel growing church that the walls would have to be busted out they'd start have to have massive tent revival meetings that, <laughs> that things would start happening in such a powerful way that revival would transcend father and that this whole state would be impacted this whole nation would be impacted and father may true revival come um i'm gonna bring my wife up for a little battle song because we in a war. You want me to introduce? You want to introduce? Which mic should she grab, John? Which mic? This one? Okay. So, here, I'll let my wife introduce the song. No, no, go ahead and sing the song, and then, then, then they'll come up. Shalom, everyone. Um, amen. Thank you for that word. And God is uh, giving my husband strong words lately, just really, really, you know, what's going on, what, what we need to be focused on. It's a blessing. Um, and I'm sure you guys are aware of all that is going on in Israel. You know, we don't live far from where a lot of that stuff happened. So um, our home is in a rod, like my husband said, and... We know a lot of people personally who were affected. And um, our, through our little ministry, we've been able to um, get, you know, just by doing this, this isn't my favorite thing to do. I would love to be home. Um, but you know, there are seasons for everything. And I know like that God has given us a purpose for such a time as this. Can you say, Lazman Hazek, can you say that? Lazman Hazeh. Lazman Hazeh in Hebrew means for such a time as this. And um, incidentally, that's also the name of my ministry. And um, we put this song out just recently, right before this, all this happened. And um, I don't know if you know this about me, if I shared it, but I was born in Tel Aviv on the Yom Kippur War of 1973. I know I'm telling you how old I am. But 50 years later, again on my birthday, <laughs> there is another war. And the Lord spoke to me about that because I was pretty depressed. I mean, as you can imagine, you know, it's hard to be away from my people right now, my family. My entire family lives in Israel, by the way. My aunts, uncles, cousins, parents, grandparents are no longer with us, but my sisters and my nieces and nephews, and many of them are serving in the IDF, in the army. So you can please keep them in prayer. Really appreciate that when you're praying for Israel. And, um, but the Lord spoke to me and he said, you were born for battle. Probably, probably going to be the name of my next CD if I do one. Born for battle. But the thing is that, and, and it's not a battle like between Israelis and Palestinians. It's a battle in the heavenlies. It's a battle of powers and principalities. And the Truth is that we are all born for that. Anybody who calls themselves a believer in Yeshua, a believer in Jesus, you were born for this battle. So I'm going to ask you to arise and let's dedicate ourselves to partnering with God this morning in this battle. He's the king of the angel armies. So let's rise. Let's rise, and if you need to move, if you need to move, you need to dance, you need to march, yeah, make sure that's...
pumping, come on. You feel free to worship any way you want. Rise up, rise up, oh God of the angel armies. Come and confound the enemy. Yeah. Rise up, rise up, my king and deliverer. Rise up, rise up. Rise up, rise up, oh God of the angel armies. Come and confound the enemy. Yeah. Rise up, rise up, my king and deliverer. Rise up, rise up. In Hebrew, it's Kuma Adonai. Kuma Adonai, that means arise, O oh Lord. a million hits on YouTube. It's amazing to me. Amazing, never happened before, but from all over the earth. I don't even know how it's getting there, but God is doing something because this is Lasman Hase. This is the time. 
This is the time for battle. And I want to encourage you to get in on it. Get in on the battle. And if you guys want to go to my YouTube page and subscribe, I would love that. No, it's not on there. But Lazman has the music that's worthy brief also. You can do that too. But you can put that Lazman has that just for a second so people can take a picture of it. And we're also on Facebook and Instagram if you want to keep in touch with us. And also, if you know of a pastor or anybody else who might be interested in having uh, a night for Israel or, you know, uh, uh, some information, just we covet your prayers for us and we covet any, any, um, whoop, we covet any, uh, you know, things you, you want to throw out our way, you know, people you know who might be interested. And um, we have a table out there, you know, it's Valentine's Day coming up. And uh, if you want to get something for your girl. Here. Well, that was a good plug, honey. <laughs> hey, listen. Um, this war isn't going to end anytime soon. I'm just going to be honest with you. This war is probably going to go through the summer. The IDF was told, the commanders were told not to plan any vacations. So right now is the time to start praying for the salvation of Israel. Not just praying for Israel, for the salvation of Israel. I think that our numbers will triple or quadruple. And as you pray for the salvation of Israel, a blessing is going to come to your own house. In my own personal life, uh, when I got radically saved, my parents just thought I went from a, a drug addict, grateful deadhead, to a Jesus freak, and they didn't know what to do with me. But it wasn't until I actually moved to Israel and became a light to the Jewish people that my parents came to faith. I believe if you've got friends and family and you have people that you're praying for and you're praying for a breakthrough, you start blessing Israel the way that God wants to bless them. A blessing is coming back to your house. And I think there's something to unlock there. The salvation of the nations depends on the salvation of Israel. And every, it's, they're interconnected. It's, it's not one or the other. That God set it up because he's trying to create in us one new man, Jew and Gentile. That we're unified, that we're family through the banner of the Jewish Messiah. And it's time now. Listen, we, we're going to have some time. I know that we went over time. It's okay. But make sure your heart, heart is right before you leave this place. I mean, God wants to pour out upon you the rivers of living water. He doesn't want to give you a glass of water. He don't want to give you a pitcher. He just says, would you just open up so that the rivers can flow through you? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for these guys. You know, as, as they were talking, I was just thinking, you know, Jesus... What did he talk about more than anything? Do you know? The kingdom. The kingdom of God. And when you get saved, it's not just so that you can just have a better life. It's so that your, your entire life, your entire purpose, and I mean, it's totally shifted to the things of the kingdom. And, and I just, I, can, can we just close our eyes for just a moment here? I, I want us to recommit to that real quick. We are so self-focused, me included. The kingdom of God is everything that's in, in his heart. It, it's And so, Lord, we, we just make a recommitment, Lord. I'm about the things of God. Can you just say that to the Lord? I'm, Lord, I want to be about the kingdom. Lord, I will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will be taken care of, Lord. I, I've got to get my mind on the things of the kingdom, Lord, upon salvation, upon people that are, that are hurting and lost and the broken, Lord, and, and about accomplishing the things that you've put in my path, Lord, that you've given to me. Well, Lord, what, what have you put in my hand, Lord? God, shift our, our thinking, shift our hearts, Lord, to the things of, of your heart, Lord, your kingdom, Lord. Shift that mindset, Lord. Let us see things with spiritual eyes. Let us see our neighbors with spiritual eyes. Let us see our work, our co-workers, our businesses, our schools with spiritual eyes, Lord. Help me see things 
through your perspective, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being here today. Hey, we're going to open up these time. If you want to just have some time with the Lord, I'm sure George will be down here. Well, you, are you guys going to be in the back? Where are you going to go? If people want prayer, we're going to be down here at the front. Um, you said, too, too, that some of those people, some of the stuff that out there is from Jewish people that, I mean, but they're like, you know, no tourism, anything's happening. So this is, this is going to bless them. So God bless you guys. Have a great, great day. We'll see you soon.